Hey there, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us. I'm Varun Shreer. I'm with UCAN and thrilled to be joined by Coach Greg McMillan. We're going to chat about how to run your fastest 5K today. Greg, thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Love being with you. This is a topic that you have a lot of expertise on. Um, just before we kick things off, when, when did you run your first 5K ever? What was your intro to the 5K? In cross country in high school, we traditionally ran three miles as our normal kind of course. But every now and then there would be a championship style race like the USA Track and Field Junior Olympics or something like that. That was 5K. And to me, that kind of blew my mind. Like, oh, my gosh, 5K instead of three miles. Of course, not realizing it was just uh, about 200 meters longer. So that was my first introduction to the 5k and I will be honest it's one of my favorite events even though I've won a national championship in the trail marathon I still feel like the 5k is the one event that uh, I love to train for it and you can race so many of them that's kind of a, a fun event to get ready for what's the last 5k you ran uh, last 5k on the roads was last 4th of July actually uh, so coming up on a year for that I have done others in cross country uh, and you know, in the fall, but a slightly different situation than obviously racing it on the roads where you can go for time. Now, as a coach, Greg, you've, you've worked with, um, you know, athletes from pros and Olympians all, all the way down to first timers. Um, your, your coaching experience in the 5K, give, give folks listening a sense of, you, you know, the, the diverse types of athletes you've coached in the 5K. Well, I've kind of coached the whole spectrum, really. I mean, I've, I've coached a lot of new runners who are just getting in the sport and trying to finish the first 5K. That's like the big goal and a huge accomplishment for them to be able to go from I can't run around the block to I can finish this race and get a medal and all the fun things that, that come that way to age group athletes who are winning medals in championships at uh, you know 40 years old, 50 year old, 60 year old, 70 year olds, though it's a lot of fun to help athletes that way. And then obviously working with the pros who run mind boggling paces for their 5K, you know, close to four minutes per mile, 1321, for example, one of the athletes I coach for 5K, which is a crazy when you think about uh, how fast that is for 3.1 miles. And the same on the women's side. Um, those athletes running 15, 30 or so for 5K. So just really exceptional runners uh, running really fast all the way to athletes that, um, you know, have the same sort of accomplishment when they get to cross that line. It's been a lot of fun. So with that, you know, we're going to build on all of that expertise and experience that you've had over the years working with all types of athletes as well as your own training for the 5K to really help people and guide people on how to run their fastest 5K. Um, and as part of that, Greg, we're going to talk about training, we're going to talk about pacing, mental toughness, and nutrition. So let's get right into it. Um, let, let's start out with training. Uh, when, when folks are training for a 5K, what are, what are some of the foundational things that they should know? Well, obviously, you have to have a base of running before you get ready for to run your fastest 5K. So we'll kind of talk about this as somebody who's already done some running and they probably raced a few times. But now it's like, OK, I want to run my absolute best. And when you think about racing your best in the 5K, you know, most of us finish between 15 minutes and 30 minutes for our 5K. That's kind of the bulk of people really training to race their fastest. And what that does physiologically is it means you're running at a pace that's faster than your lactate threshold. So your lactate threshold speed is usually about your one hour race pace. So you're going to finish faster than that. So you're already faster than your lactate threshold. And that means that you are producing more lactic acid than your body can clear. And I think most of us, if you've ever run really fast, you know, okay, if you're producing more lactic acid, you're going to be breathing really heavy and fatigue is going to start accumulating very quickly. And also you have a lot of mental gamesmanship, right? A lot of those voices of, oh my gosh, I'm really hurting. And then toward the end of 5Ks, you actually get up toward your VO2 max, the maximum amount of oxygen that you can take in and accumulate. So as a result, it's a very stressful sort of event to run well. It requires heavy breathing. It requires a lot of mental the sort of strength to battle the sort of sensations that you get back from your body when you are trying to run that fast. So you've got to do some workouts that replicate that feeling. You've got to do some workouts to try to improve your lactate threshold. Those are things, common workouts would be 
tempo runs, for example. That's something like a 15 to 25 minute medium hard effort run, kind of around your one hour race pace, which might be sort of 10K to 15K race pace for a lot of athletes. Uh, those kind of workouts really help push that lactate threshold faster. Then you can do some workouts that are slightly faster than the lactate threshold, call those cruise intervals. That's a great workout to do. These are shorter repetition type workouts, maybe two, three, four, five minutes at sort of that 10K-ish type feel effort, uh, and then a little bit recovery in between that seems to help push the lactate threshold faster. And what that does, of course, is it keeps the lactic, lactic acid from accumulating as quickly across the, uh, the, your 5K. And then of course, to address the VO2 max component, sort of your heaviest breathing, that's more traditional speed work that you see athletes do, whether they're doing 400 meter repeats or one minute repeats, up to three, four, five minute repeats or 800 meter repeats, mile repeats, those things done at sort of 5K pace or even faster, where you're really challenging yourself to sort of breathe heavy, keep pushing, keep accomplishing during the repetition, taking a fairly, you know, a reasonable recovery so that you can attack the next repetition. So those are kind of the two specialty types of workouts that you balance in training to run your fastest 5k and they're really tough on you i mean they're hard to do and mentally you really have to be strong but that ultimately is preparing you for exactly what you're going to face in the race you know for somebody that might just have started running 5ks and the first couple times you know you might be more focused on running the distance right simply just running the distance over and over again and then you start switching over to the types of workouts that you were describing where it's more strategic to try to be faster. In your experience of a coach, when somebody makes that switch, I mean, how much improvement can you see just simply from training in that more specialized way? Well, it depends on the athlete, but if you have a newer athlete or someone who hasn't been training for the 5K, a lot of athletes say they start at the marathon or half marathon, they check those off the list and then they, okay, I've done a 5K, but now I want to see how fast I can be. They can take very large chunks of time off their finishing time by doing that specific type of training. Because if you think about it, in a lot of our endurance running, particularly if you're training for a half marathon or a marathon, you don't get exposed to the same kind of suffering that you have when you're doing running really hard for a 5K. When you're breathing very heavily, when you're sort of at maximum toward the end, that's a very stressful thing. So the more exposure you can have to it in training, it just means you'll race a lot faster. And I've seen athletes take gigantic slices of time off of uh, off their finish time just by doing sort of race specific preparation. I guess conversely, when people are, as you alluded to, marathoners and they are running their 5K and doing this type of workout, uh, these types of workouts, is it then translating to helping them improve their marathoning? Does it work conversely the other way as well? Sure. Uh, I think one of the things that we see in the longer distances is that typically, in general, you would say that the faster you are at the shorter distances, it translates into being faster at the longer distances. Obviously, you have to do the training for the longer distances, but in general, the types of workouts that you do to be faster at 5K or 10K, they help you build these sort of qualities of your fitness that can then translate into better training when you go to train for a half marathon or a marathon. In terms of training, you also, um, just one final component of the training, you have a little tip that people can utilize at the end of their workouts to to help boost the workout. Um, what is that? Well, I think a lot of times at the end of a 5K, uh, you want to sprint. But if you've been training for other races or just training to finish, you don't really think about really developing that ability to sprint at the end. Uh, but it can it can help you a lot in improving your time. When I would work with the pro athletes, for example, even though they were running really fast, we would still try to gain four to 10 seconds over the last half mile, the last 800 meters of the race. We're trying to increase our pace that much faster than they had been running for their goal pace. That's just extra time off 
that they're going to get in their finish time. So I encourage athletes to begin to incorporate some of that, not, not all out sprinting necessarily, but definitely some faster running, some strides, something where they begin to challenge themselves to be able to switch gears toward the end and have that really strong finish over the last 400 or 800 meters. Number one, you'll pass a lot of people, which is a lot of fun. And number two, you'll see your time improve as well. It's a lot of great information about training, Greg. And, and you know, there's a lot that goes into it, clearly. I mean, running, you know, running a 5K, the distance itself may not seem intimidating for everybody, but to run fast, um, you've laid out a lot of things that go into the training that can help you specifically run faster. Um, now, how about pacing? You know, pacing, I think, for, for the marathon, it's, it's something that kind of naturally comes up where you know you're going that distance, you better pace yourself and be reasonable about it. But how should we, uh, people think about pacing in the 5K? And, and I'm sure there's common mistakes that people make there as well. Yeah, I think it's the number one way to improve your 5K is to improve how you pace your 5K. Most of us, of course, go too fast in the beginning. Either we're so excited for the race and we just charge out the gate, or we're nervous about, oh, this pace is so much faster than my half marathon or my marathon, so I should really go really hard. But if you can improve your pacing in the 5K, you can significantly improve your time. And pacing, proper pacing in the 5K is even splits. So, you know, in the marathon, a lot of times we talk about a negative split, meaning you run the first half slightly slower, so you have more energy for the second half. In the 5K, we actually like it to be even splits. Now, most people run it as a positive split where they go faster in the beginning and slower at the end. We would prefer it to be even. But the thing that people don't recognize is that even pacing in a 5K is not the same as even effort in a 5K. The effort has to ramp up exponentially across a 5K just to hold the same pace. Because as I mentioned before, you're producing more lactic acid than you can clear. You're approaching your VO2 max. These, this is really heavy fatiguing type of running. So you really have to raise your effort up in order to be able to stay on pace. I have an article on my website called Go Zone Racing. It's a method of thinking about how you're going to pace yourself, not just in the pace, but in your mental effort across the race. And if you apply it to a 5K, it actually helps you quite a bit. Because once you get past halfway in a 5K, a lot of athletes begin to lose pace because it's getting hard. And they are hoping it wouldn't get hard, <laughs> but you have to accept it is and raise your effort just to stay on pace. If you use that go, the go zone racing method, I've found it really sets athletes up to have their strongest race and their fastest time. The setting up a goal pace, I mean, how, how should people approach, you know, what a reasonable goal pace is and then once you kind of identify that, how do you how do you actually stick to it and, and make sure that you're consistent with that? Yeah, that's kind of one of the first steps, isn't it? We need to figure out, OK, what is a reasonable time for you to shoot for for your 5K? Now, if you've run another distance, maybe you've run a 10K or half marathon or something like that, you can put it in my McMillan running calculator and then it will say, OK, you've run a 10K in this time it predicts you could finish your 5K in this time. And that can give you a ballpark of like, okay, this is a good starting point for me to say, this is my goal pace for the upcoming 5K. And then you should do some 5K goal pace workouts. In all my training plans, I have a sequence of goal pace workouts. Usually once every two to three weeks, I'm having the athlete do some sort of goal pace running. It does two things. Number one, it helps you groove that goal pace so that when you get in the 5K, it's not a foreign pace for you. The second is physiologically, you know, it, it, you get all those adaptations we want to make you better at your lactate threshold, to improve your VO2 max. Uh, but the other is that it begins to tell you, is your goal pace reasonable or not? Because if you can't hit the goal pace in these sort of small bits within these goal pace workouts, then you're probably not gonna be ready to do it in your race. So it kind of helps the athlete and me as the coach say, okay, this was the range we thought might work, but now we've really got it dialed in. The goal pace workouts have really showed us 
this is a great pace for you for your race. And that, you know, is comforting for the athlete. They can know, okay, my pace is X. That's what I need to hit in the first mile. Boom. I, I, it makes it easy almost. You don't have to wonder what pace you should do. And that sequence of building from short exposure to 5K pace in early goal pace workouts to longer and longer exposure, really, once you get to the race, you are so dialed in with goal pace that you're almost on automatic pilot. And then it just becomes a mental game of can I push when I get tired? And that's a great setup for running your best 5K. So you kind of bridged right into the next uh, component of our discussion, which is mental toughness. And, and I keep taking this back to endurance, you know, but or, or to the marathon. But again, that mental toughness, a lot of times you really associate it with pushing the body to go distance, you know, and having to be tough to endure that distance. But you mentioned it right off the top when we were talking about training, like having the mental toughness and teaching yourself how to suffer with some of these workouts is is a huge part of it. So where does mental toughness come into play for the 5K and how do you get mentally tougher? Well, the first thing you have to do is accept that there's going to be a lot of suffering. If you want to run as fast as you can for 3.1 miles, you must accept because as we mentioned, you're breathing super heavy. You've got a lot of lactic acid. Your brain is screaming at you. Why are you doing this? You can slow down. So for you to go into that situation, I think you have to accept racing your fastest 5K comes with a big sort of component of mental suffering. Now, what you do in training, of course, is you give small bits of this. You give small exposures to this type of mental suffering. And over time, your brain gets better at kind of dealing with it, right? It gets more used to it. So it doesn't scream at you as much that this is hurting. And then when you are kind of suffering in these workouts, you're able to keep pushing and keep challenging yourself. I always tell athletes, hey, the last 25% of these 5K type workouts, that's where you want to be suffering. You want to be suffering so that you can challenge yourself to keep going while suffering because that's what you're going to be faced with on race day. And so if you do it over time, the body and the mind can get very used to the discomfort that you will face, but you kind of got to you got to want it. You got to accept it and you got to say this is what I'm doing this for. I'm looking forward to that sort of suffering toward the end because if you go into it with a like a positive aspect of the suffering, then it's more it's something that the runner can do, right? Because runners are used to accomplishing. We're about we're about finishing, right? We want to start something and finish. So if you go into the race with the, I know it's going to be challenging. I know there's going to be big suffering, but I'm going to keep pushing even though I'm tired. I think that's another great way to set yourself up for your fastest 5K. The worst suffering experience you've ever faced, was it running a 5K or running a marathon? Oh, I don't know. They they are different types of suffering, and I think that's sometimes why you know a 5K runner who's really good at the 5K, and we see this at the pro level a lot of times. They're really good at the short distances, and they move to longer distances, and they don't perform the same way because that fatigue is different. I think for a lot of us more recreational runners, we see oh, I really I got really good at the half marathon and the marathon, and I could. I could handle that type of suffering. And then you give this exposure to this really different type of suffering. And that's a big challenge for them as well. So for me as a coach, I'm just saying, hey, let's just accept that this is what you're going to be faced with. Let's get small exposures to it over time in training. And let's begin to develop some mental tricks, some mantras, some sort of anything that you can do to help you refocus away from focusing on the suffering and more on what you can do to perform your best. I think a lot of great runners, they have something they think about when the going gets tough, right? They have a mantra or they have, I'm going to shake my arms out or they go to their arm. They, they think about their form or the breathing, whatever it is, they have something they go to. So they've pre-planned a strategy for when it does get tough. And as a result, they're able to keep pushing even though the suffering is quite high. Yeah, that's uh, the mantra. I know you've talked about the mantra you've used. Um, I think when you were running the marathon the, um, in the past, just forcing yourself to smile. Is there any particular mantra that you've used 
personally at the 5K or, or, or one particularly memorable one you've had an athlete use? Yeah, I feel like when I was in, I was good in high school. I was state champion in high school, when I, but I, I, never, I never felt like I raced as well as I could. I feel like my racing IQ really went up in college. And ultimately it was, it was when I recognized that is gonna, there's going to be suffering. And I felt like it was a vote. I feel like when you start to get fatigued and you start to have these mental sort of conversations in your head saying, hey, why are you doing this? You could slow down all the things that runners think about when times start to get tough. I viewed it as a vote. I could vote to either back off slightly and suffer a little bit less, or I could vote to push. I could vote to, you know, keep doing what I was doing, stay on pace or catch that person or run strong to that turn or whatever, you know, was I was able to use and I would see it as a vote. And then I got to start looking forward to the vote. I said, bring on the vote because I know I'm going to choose to go. I'm going to choose to keep pushing because for me, and I think for a lot of runners, the pain of regret of not doing your best in a race is way better, is way more, is way worse, I should say, way worse than the pain of I gave it my all for whatever. And it's only five or 10 minutes in a race, right? It's not the whole race that you have this, you know, huge level of suffering. So I looked at it as I would much rather trade five or 10 minutes of significant suffering from that pain and regret of not feeling like I know I didn't quite do my best. So for me, it was always a vote. I was just like, bring it on every time that voice happens where it's like you could back off or don't push or don't go with that person who just passed you. Every time I was like, bring it on. I'm going to vote to keep going. That's when I feel like I really learned to race. And then I could race well at all distances, carrying that idea of, yes, it's going to be challenging, but I'm okay with that. I look forward to that challenging. That's what I want because I know if I do my best, I'll be so satisfied when I finish. And I think that's what all of us are looking for. That's um, really great, really great insight. And I think something that you, you highlighted before is that, you know, whether it's the mantra, whether it's suffering, it's something that requires practice. And the more you experience it, the more, you know, you can draw on to push yourself through it. Um, the final component of our discussion today, Greg, is the element of fueling for the 5K. And, you know, I'll set up this topic like I've set up many of the other ones, it's something that often when you're talking about the marathon, fueling can be the emphasis. When we're talking about the 5K, it's often something that goes overlooked. Um, and specifically as it pertains to you can, you know, we've talked a lot um, in different shows we've done together about the benefits of you can for endurance training, uh, you can providing that slower releasing energy that keeps your blood sugar steady for a much longer period of time than your traditional carb sources. But you found that UCAN also has a, a place in 5K training and racing as well. Um, what are the, some of the ways that you found it's been beneficial to utilize UCAN as part of 5K training? Yeah, for myself and certainly for athletes that I've worked with, I think that UCAN fits in nicely when you're, say you're going to do a, one of these hard, heavy breathing workouts, a speed workout or something like that in the afternoon. Obviously, you don't want to eat a big lunch because those workouts are tough on the stomach. I think anybody who's run really hard and done these hard workouts, you know GI distress can be there. So having something like you can allows you not to have so much food on your stomach, but yet you've got to steady energy. You're not hungry going into that workout. That way you can get more out of the workout. That's been a great tool for athletes to use, athletes to use so that they're not hungry going into the workout, but they don't have a lot on their stomach. I know for me, I use it as my breakfast before 5Ks because, again, I don't like to race a short race like a 5K with a lot on my stomach, which is, of course, different than for the marathon where you do want to make sure you have a, a big breakfast before the race. For a 5K, I want very little on my stomach, but I don't want to be hungry. So I think Generation U can really fits in nicely as those two sort of pre-race and then certainly pre-hard workout. If you're going to do something really hard, you don't want to put a big meal on your stomach. It really is a great substitute from that standpoint. And that would be, um, you know, like Greg was talking about for the workouts, you could certainly use the UCAN performance energy powder 
um, before one of these hard workouts. And then if you're using it for breakfast, you could use the version of you can with the added protein. So you're getting both the energy from the super starch, the carb in the you can, as well as the added component of protein, which could, you know, help satiate you for breakfast. Um, that's great, Greg. Great, a great insight into kind of a, a different way to think about you can versus the, the marathon fuel or, or the long run fuel. Um, so in closing, you know, we really, we've touched on it all. We've talked about training, pacing, uh, fueling, the mental side of 5K running. Um, anything you just want to add in closing about, you know, kind of final words of wisdom on how to run your fastest 5K? Well, I think you got to do the training. Like I said, you know, you can read the 5K workouts article that I have on my site. I think you got to race smart. That's the go zone method. I think that that works very well. And then the main component is just have your mind right for a significant amount of suffering and be and know that that's normal, that that's what happens when you are pushing yourself sort of to run really fast in the 5K. And if you train yourself, you have some exposure to feeling that way. It doesn't have to be the whole workout. Like I said, I particularly like the first part of workouts to be controlled. But then the last part is like, OK, you got tired so you could get to this part of the workout where you're really challenged. I think you bring that mental toughness into the 5K. You set yourself up uh, to run your best time. And remember, you can run several 5Ks across a training season. Unlike the marathon where sort of everything's in this one basket of I've got one shot to perform. The 5K, sometimes it takes you two or three or four 5Ks to really nail exactly how to pace it, exactly how to push yourself, uh, and then sprint at the end to gain those extra seconds. That's great, Greg. Great, uh, great final advice. And you, you talked over the course of this about the, your pacing calculator, your a couple, some nutrition articles, uh, I mean, sorry, sorry, some workout articles with some of these workouts we discussed. Uh, where can people find all that? Just go to mcmillanrunning.com. All the information is there. I got a full library of training articles. You'll see the world's best 5K workout article in there. You'll see the go zone method there. On the homepage, you'll find the Macmillan running calculator so you can calculate your training paces and then predict your race times. All of that is uh, can be found on mcmillanrunning.com. Perfect. So if you're listening to this, if you like some of the tips that Greg gave you and you want to put these into action, that's how to do it. Greg, thanks so much for the insight. Um, we'll do this again real soon. You bet. Take care.